of the vintage and of certainly of the region, uh, but also have some complexity and ageability to the wine as well. Um, 2017 was a really interesting year in Marlborough. Um, it was, you know, we had two in a row actually, 2017, 2018, and in certain ways had challenges. 2017, a little bit different to 18, and it was, it was cooler, but we did have rain in 2017. The rain in 2017, though, was a little bit later. And what was very interesting is we found that with Sauvignon Blanc, uh, it certainly caused a few challenges with, with getting right flavors and the right acidity balance in the wines. But Pinot Noir and Chardonnay both ripened quite early in 2017. And both varieties produced what I think are really fantastic examples of the region and quite rich, robust styles uh, for both of those varieties. For me, uh, 2017 Pinot and Marlborough is about good color, um, uh, which is always an added bonus, not necessarily the be all and end all for Pinot, but, but you know, a, a lovely thing to have. Uh, and certainly really good structure. I found that 2017 produced wines with a really lovely tannin structure and very bright acidity. It's, it's a really lovely style, I think. So for the 2017 Resolute, we picked it quite early. We were quite keen to retain that brightness of acidity and, and really reflect what we do get in Marlborough, which is lovely natural acidity. And also, I think going back to what Jules said, you know, it's really fascinating tonight tasting wines from different regions. And with Marlborough, we've, we've, we've seen an evolution of Pinot Noir over the last few years, which has been quite profound. And I think the quality of the Pinot and Marlborough has just got better and better and better. Uh, we're, we're spoiled in New Zealand with fantastic Pinot Noir regions. And I think in Marlborough, we can really classify ourselves as certainly one of those, one of those great regions. A lot of it has been, it, like, like with any Pinot Noir, all about site selection. It's such a great variety. We all know, we all know the variety, we love it. And we all know that it's possibly the best variety for reflecting its sense of place. It really does reflect its soil profile, its aspects, everything about uh, where you grow the variety. And for me, I know, I know personally, I really find that the soil profile comes through almost, um, almost directly in the tannin structure of the wine. We've got a few vineyards here in Marlborough that are clay based and I find those wines tend to have a really clay sort of soft rich tannin that is quite mouth filling and silky uh, and then some other vineyards that are more gravelly in soil and they have more bony tannin almost gravelly tannin um, so it's almost sort of directly reflecting. The Aura Resolute what we've done here is created a wine that's a blend of both of those um, soil profiles trying to get a richness uh, and a uh, fullness to the mid palate, but also some bite to the finish, a bit of sort of phenolic bite that gives the wine ageability and a bit of structure. Wine making wise, again, very, very simple. I did say that Resolute is about being a little bit more funky with the wine making, but with Pinot Noir, I think when it's harvested, hand harvested, uh, most of it destemmed, we leave about 10% as whole bunch. Uh, we don't go too high with the whole bunch on this particular wine. And then thereafter, fermentation, we try and do as little to it as we possibly can. I know it's cliche, but definitely sort of try and, and let the wine make itself as much as possible. There is that risk of over extraction and over extraction of seed tannin and, uh, and even skin tannin. So we try and focus our extraction on the first quarter of fermentation or the first third. So relatively regular working of the ferments and the cap in the first third of ferment. Once we get down to about 10 bricks or eight bricks, we really back off and we barely do anything to it. Just sort of leave it to its own devices and, and build itself as a wine rather than us interfering with it. After that, pretty straightforward, we take it off skins. Uh, this wine here won't have any pressings in it. It's all free run. Um, it's racked and then goes to 100% French oak. A little bit more than the, the previous example we had from Jules there, it's 25% new French oak. Um, it's all 300 litre hogsheads rather than the 225s, and we prefer those larger barrels. They just for, for this style, they just seem to give a bit more um, uh, sort of purity to the wine and a nicer integration of the oak. Uh, then you've got 10, 12 months in oak, comes out of barrel, gets filtered, and into a bottle. So it is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, all right, let's have a taste. So I think, yeah, like I said, I think the color is, is still really good. Um, it's, it's definitely got a nice brightness to it. It's a lovely sort of, you know, sort of mid crimson purple color. And on the nose, you certainly see that, that heavier oak influence. Um, there's some interest there, a bit of spice, and definitely some, some cherry notes for me, which really give that sort of uh, Southern Valley's Marlborough characteristic.
and the palette to me, I think the word that for me sums up the palette is, is real freshness. It's got a real brightness to it. That lower pH, you can really see that. It's quite mouth-watering. It's not a particularly heavy Pinot Noir, uh, but I think it has some lovely energy. And then what you get from that for me is some length, really has some really good carry through the palette. And there's just a little bite of, of tannin on the finish. It just lets you know it's there, gives it a bit of presence, uh, and I think makes it pretty good with food. Um, yeah, um, questions? Duncan, it's fantastic to see it at the, um, you know, the contrast and styles. And obviously we've got two years between Jules and the Ara as well. But I think there's a real delicacy there to it. Um, and, you know, that freshness as well. But, um, you know, the delicacy sort of is, is something that captures you. And then you realise that actually it's still going. And it might be delicate, but it's just got so much power behind that. It's a, it's a lovely wine. Good. Well done. Really good. No worries. No, look, it's such a great variety. I think that, you know, with you know, the reason we're all here is that we love the variety. And I think that uh, it has that ability to be both delicate, uh, but also have power and length at the same time and lovely aromatics. Um, it's inherently drinkable. I think at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Um, you pop it in the glass and uh, yeah, it's just such a drinkable, drinkable variety. Cool. Very good. Um, and any questions for Duncan before we uh, let him go and move on to our third Marlborough Pinot Noir? I think, uh, Duncan, you've done an exceptionally good job at describing that. I think that's why there's not a flood of questions down the side. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll talk a little bit more about this wine um, at the end as well because um, this wine's very much coming to the end of its availability as well, isn't it? It is, it is, yeah. Unfortunately, it is, uh, it's just running out fast. <laughs> <laughs> very, very fast. Cool. Thank you, Duncan. Um, we're going to stick with Marlborough and uh, the third wine that we're going to go to is the Jackson Estate Vintage Widow. And we're very lucky tonight to go from a 2019 to 2017 and now to a 2016 uh, Pinot Noir from Marlborough. So great to be able to see three different expressions of Marlborough, but also three uh, different vintages. So we will move to Matt. Uh, and I think, Matt, you've unmuted yourself. Thank you. And hand it over to you to tell us about Jackson Estate. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, uh, can you hear me? See me? I'm going. Can hear and see you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Jules and Duncan were saying, I think this is a great format. Um, you know, in these times that are a bit trying, but uh, everyone can actually you know, still interact, and it's a great opportunity to talk to the consumers directly about uh, the wines that hopefully they're enjoying that we're making and they're enjoying. But um, yeah, I'll give you a bit of a, a little bit of a rundown about um, Jackson Estate and this wine. Um, we're not a particularly well-known company, I don't think, in New Zealand, but we've been around a long time uh, in some form or, or other, an agricultural um, format. Jackson Estate's been around for nearly 180 years, and we've been making wine for nearly 30 years of that time. Um, and we're 100% 100% estate controlled, so we have three vineyards. We don't use uh, contract growers. Um, this particular wine that you're looking at in front of you um, comes from two vineyards that are in the Southern Valley. So they're in the Waihopai Valley, they're right beside one another. Um, and they are on heavy clay pans, both on 10 metre clay pans. Uh, the vineyard that is slightly lower down the valley, the Somerset Vineyard, has an alluvial gravel, about 25 centimetres of gravel over the top of it. And the other vineyard, the Gum Emperor Vineyard, has about 20 centimetres of a stony loam. So the only real difference between the two vineyards is that top 20 to 25 percent, or 25 centimetres, sorry, of the soil type. Um, same environmental conditions. 2016 was a very interesting vintage. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware. 15 was a pretty light vintage. Most people came in pretty light and um, tonnage crops were down. Um, we saw about a 30% reduction in our Pinot from 2015. Um, we were a bit concerned that 2016 had the potential to be a heat and great monster, but in actual fact, it turned out to be pretty much on the norm for us. Um, it was very dry over the growing season, uh, to the point where we actually started to see a little bit of stress in some of the vines. 
uh, and very small bunches of very tight, very small berries, small bunches, tight bunches. Um, and the fruit, when it was starting to maturate, was starting to mature, we could really see there was a great deal of potential in it, but we were a little concerned that we might not have the legs to get uh, the fruit to, in the condition that we wanted it in. Uh, luckily, we had a little bit of rain um, towards the end of March that actually freshened up the vines and really allowed us to um, get the fruit across the line. So when we started harvesting, we literally went from the first day of picking to be almost 100% done in seven days. Um, and that's partly because we have the two vineyards that are right side by side and they ripen roughly at the same time. We have multi-clones in there, but we've found that even between the earliest ripening clone and the later ripening clones, there tends to only be somewhere between a week to two weeks in ripeness level, and we tend to bring everything in relatively uh, at the same time. Um, this particular wine, everything's hand harvested. Now, the Somerset Vineyard, it's an interesting vineyard because it's very Burgundian in style. There's lots of um, lifted florals, lots of rose petals, violets, really nice dry herbal crunchy notes that come through. The palette's very elegant, um, a lot of longevity. The Gum Emperor Vineyard, on the other hand, which is right beside it and, and only has that top layer of soil that's the real difference, is a great hunking great beast of a thing and it's lots of power. There's earthy, spicy, cedar, cigar box, bacon fat type notes that come through. A lot of, um, you know, those sort of forest floor type characters. Uh, and combined, they're roughly 50-50, the two vineyards in this wine. Um, the Gum Emperor block, we've learned over the course of time, does really well with time on skins, but doesn't give us any great reward with whole bunching. Whereas the Somerset doesn't do well with uh, time on skins, but rewards with some whole bunching. So the Gum Emperor block, uh, everything's hand harvested. Uh, all the clones are kept completely separate right the way through to blending 12 months later. Um, run up to 45 days, maybe 50 days on skins. Um, seven days cold soaked, everything's de-stemmed. Um, seven days cold soak, pretty much just pat the cat by hand. Um, just keep it gas, keep it nice and fresh. Wild ferment, aim for around 33 degrees, peak ferment. Uh, and we plunge based on cap temperatures. So it's all done by hand. Uh, we'll go around and look at the condition of the caps. Peak ferment might be twice a day. Um, once we start sort of cooling down and start getting down to six or seven bricks, it drops down to maybe once a day. And then as is required. The Somerset Vineyard will run up to 50% whole bunch in that. Um, but considerably less time on skins. It's only on skins about 20 days in total, including seven days cold soak. Same deal, wild ferment. Um, yeah, and get into those low 30s for, for um, peak fermentation. Uh, and then just carefully manage the caps. Um, and it's really interesting. I've, I've spent a bit of time playing around with pulse air and various other things. And I've, I've come to the realization that the gum emperor block, it does reward with a little bit of pulse air early in the stage, but later on in the ferment, um, it's, it's purely hand plunging. And the Somerset's hand plunging the whole way through. We don't do any real trickery to it. Um, don't do any pump overs or anything like that. Uh, when we've made the decision, tasting through, you know, we taste them twice a day to make the decision as to when we're gonna drop them, press them off and allow them to um, settle in tank for maybe 24 hours before going to barrel. So it's 100% French oak. Um, like Duncan, we're around 25% new oak. And I tend to use fairly restrained coopers. I don't go with heavy toasts or anything like that. It's more about having that oak framework to hang that fruit on. Um, natural malos, and, and our malos tend to not go through until the following Christmas time. So it's usually a bit of a uh, sort of holding your breath, hoping that they'll get through before we need to blend and empty the barrels before the next vintage comes around. But they tend to be in barrels somewhere between 10 to 12 months. And confirmation of malo is usually about the ninth or 10th month. Um, so that the rest of the time we just keep them topped. We don't sulfur them at any point. We only sulfur them when we've uh, pulled them out and put the blend together. Um, 
And then we, we tend to just filter it, um, give it a light stability, tend to filter it. And then it's held in bottle for at least two years before we release it. So one of the things that we do with all the Jackson wines is they're all bottle aged before we release them. We're in a pretty enviable position to be able to hold vintages for a period of time in uh, climate controlled warehouses before we release it. So this is the 16, it's only been available for maybe eight months. Um, You'll probably know the stock levels better than me. <laughs> Don't deal with that side of the desk. Um, but uh, it's a wine that's really interesting. I think after the 2015, which was a real sort of blockbuster, um, I find this has a great deal more elegance. And I think that because of the growing season, it's got it's slightly brighter in acidity, which I think gives it a really nice freshness. But it's got that lovely elegance that follows through on the palate from that Somerset block. And there's a real fatness, a real breadth to it, and some real weight from the Gum Emperor vineyard. Um, clonal wise, pretty much all Dijon clones. Uh, I had a look in my winemaking, the little black book of mysteries, um, just before we uh, sat down this evening. And I think there's 28 different parcels of Pinot that have gone into this particular wine. Um, that's probably more the fact that I just like, you know, chuck a Pinot in into the blend. But um, you know, they all add something. Um, you know, it, it's a really interesting thing being, to be able to play around with that number of, of uh, clonal batches um, for your main blending wines. So, yeah, we'll have a quick taste of it and see what everyone thinks. Hmm. Does anyone have any questions or any comments on that for Matt? I think. Yeah, Matt, it's it's drinking really, really well tonight. I haven't tried that for a, a little while. In fact, I, I think since um, it sort of came out end of last year and fantastic to be able to go back and um, look at it um, again. And I think, you know, listening to you talk about the different parcels coming together for it, I think it's an absolute masterstroke in blending. Um, I think, you know... <laughs> Oh, I don't know about that. I think it's more I get along and paste them about 20 times and tick, tick, tick and ticky. <laughs> oh, you're too, you're too oh. modest. It's very, very good. Oh, I think, I think um, the, rea the reality of blending is that um, it, for me, it's, it's almost entirely a gut feel. You know when you taste it if it's going to make it or not and you know how it's going to fit. I don't tend to run with numbers. In fact, once it's pretty much... Um, being fermented, I don't look at numbers. I pretty much do it all by, you know, by pellet. So we have to have lab analysis, obviously, for, for the reality, but um, I tend not to follow that, which is uh, to, our, to our lab tech's great uh, horror. <laughs> but so, um, I see this. Matt, um, two, two questions there for you is um, Vintage Widow. Um, why is it called Vintage Widow? Ah, so if you, if anyone is familiar with Jackson Estate, on the front of the label, there is a tree. It's a giant gum tree that's in the grounds of our homestead vineyard. It was planted in 1867. And it's now at the age where uh, it explosively sheds branches. Now in Australia, they used to hang up in the tree and then sometimes they'd drop down and kill people and they were called widow makers. So we were going to call this wine the widow maker and uh, uh, homage of our great tree, but unfortunately, it was um, that name was taken by a vodka from Russia somewhere. So we called it the Vintage Widow in uh, respect of our partners and loved ones that stay at home during the course of vintage and essentially become widows. <laughs> <laughs> nice story, very very good. And um, we've also just had some comments there is that um, this wine delivers incredible value for money, um, which it's, it most certainly does. Um, and also a comment that there's um, some people in the room who've got older vintages in their cellar. Um, right. And they're right, still yeah. drinking very well, so. <laughs> I'd comfortably say this would go another 10 or 15 years. Yeah, agreed, yeah. Yeah, I've seen your wines age and um, I'd agree 100%. Hey, thanks very much, Matt. Um, and that's the last of our Marlborough wines tonight. And now we move to the first of our Central Otago wines, and then we are going to stay down in Otago for the rest of a tasting. And um, we start, first of all, with Rockburn, with Malcolm and their 2018. So uh, this is glass number four, folks. Hi, everybody. You can all hear me? I assume you can. 
<laughs> we can. Good. Um, so, little background around Rockburn, um, based in Cromwell. Winery's just out of Cromwell. We have two estate vineyards, one in the Pisa subregion up beside Lake Dunstan. We call that Parkburn. It's right next to the Park Burn that runs down out of the hills and our other vineyards through in Gibston, Gibston Valley, closer to Queenstown. So the point of this is to have eggs in some different baskets um, and also to bring in some of the nuances that we talk about with, with uh, terroir, Pinot Noir, um, very different terroirs between the Cromwell Basin and Gibston. What it does mean is that we essentially do two vintages back to back. Um, we'll finish picking at Parkburn, we'll ferment that, it'll be heading off to barrel by the time we even start thinking about picking in Gibston. So we spend a good six weeks doing vintage, which can compare and contrast quite quite dramatically with um, with uh, smaller estates that maybe have their vineyards quite close together. Um, soil types, Cromwell, you know, very dry. It's the heart of the desert here. It's the most sort of continental-esque climate in New Zealand, arguably. Um, very little rainfall, 400 mils, 500 mils average. Um, uh, very dry soils, very little organic matter, lots of rocks, lots of schist, lots of quartz, um, lots of rabbits uh, and thyme growing around and about. Um, so that's, that's our park burn site, is dry and rocky. Um, and then through in Gibston, um, it's cooler and damper, it's a higher elevation through there, it's more exposed to the west, so a bit more rainfall. Um, loamier soils, some of that sort of outwash out of the hills has got a bit more organic matter to it, there's more grass growing through there, I can be through there picking, tasting, tasting fruit during vintage and my boots will get wet because there's grass there, which there never is um, at our park burn site. Um, so that's the basics of it. Um, that's what goes into making the Rockburn Pinot um, 2018, which is what we're tasting. Um, I always say that every vintage has its own unique set of challenges. 2018 was really one out of the box. It was immensely hot. It was um, practically an Australian vintage. We ended up picking a month earlier than average. Um, I know there were some, some wineries in central Otago that started in February. Um, we were certainly at the, at the, not much later than that, right at the start of March, where we're normally right at the end of March to, to get started. Um, it did mean there was a bit of a gap, but more of a gap between our park and our Gibson sites, so we could almost take a breather. Um, but the main panic for me that year was uh, trying to make Pinot that tastes like Pinot, instead of just, you know, some dry red because all the nuance that we that we love about Pinot Noir have been cooked out of it. Um, so it was quite terrifying, frankly, going into that. And maybe Jen, I think Jen speaking to the wild earth shortly, um, can confirm or deny anything that I'm blathering on about. But um, yeah, 2018 was, was, was a unique struggle. Um, so I had to make sure that I was picking early enough that things were ripe and not too ripe. So it was a bit frantic bit frantic um, and pretty standard winemaking situation as we've heard from various people. Um, we have seven ton fermenters. Um, I like to plunge once or twice a day. Uh, I don't do cold soak because I don't need to. Um, Central Otago delivers fruit and colour without even trying so it just it just comes easily. So we don't need to soak anything like that. 20 odd days on skins is normal. Um, don't add any yeast or anything like that. I certainly wasn't adding any acid. Um, what else? Oak, 33% new, which I think is the highest one so far, but I hope you'll agree that this wine swallows that quite happily. Mm. Um, and then, you know, 10 months, um, natural malo in the spring. It's Sometimes it does its malo even before it goes to the barrel. It can be very enthusiastic about that sort of thing. Um, so I don't need to try too hard about any of that. Um, parcel selection happens in the field um, for Rockburn. Anything else that doesn't doesn't end up as, as a Rockburn um, aliquot um, ends up in our Devil's Staircase bottling. Um, but I do that on the fly. So if I like fruit, it'll end up in Rockburn. If I don't, it doesn't. 
So the blend is being made up as, as vintage progresses. And so what goes to barrel stays as Rockburn and we don't make any further decisions after that. Um, I'm also not big on numbers. I like to taste the wine and decide if it's a good wine or the fruit really will tell me if it's going to be um, worthy or not. Um, what else? Um, oak, so it's all French oak, um, variety of coopers. I do like heavy toasts for some of those things, but most of them uh, tend to be medium or medium long. I'm quite fond of the long toasting on, on barrels these days. Um, and I said 33% new and... Now, Kim, just a question for you. Yes. Um, so you've got the different parcels that you bring together to put this wine together. We've yes. had someone ask, do you keep them separate once you've picked them and yes. ferment them separately? Or yes. what do you do in that part of the process? Yeah, so so everything is, is, is fermented as a parcel, as a clone, um, in its own individual seven-ton fermenter, and then kept single and separate all the way through um, until it gets chucked together and becomes the Rockburn blend out the other end. Um, you know, that's pretty common across uh, most winemakers. And one thing that I really enjoy about that, that um, separation all the way through is that it then allows me to, to pick out the cream of the crop um, and make our barrel selection in a good year. Um, so we've got some of those coming out uh, very soon as well out of, out of 2019. We didn't make any, any barrel selection out of 2018. Uh, it was not what I would have uh, called a stellar vintage. I was just happy to survive it. Um, <laughs> and we are, we are getting very near the end of the, the volume of, of this wine. I think it's due to, due to sell through very, very soon, hopefully. Um, but look, it's, it's drinking really nicely. I'm actually far happier with, with how, it, um, how it turned out than, than you know, making the thing. I was, I was very, very worried about it. I think you've got nothing to be worried about um, by the comments that we're seeing come through, but we have a few more questions for you. Uh, and I'll give you both of them at the same time. The questions are uh, the percentage of whole bunch and what will be the percentage of Parkburn versus Gibston in the blend, please? Yep, so Gibston, I do like to keep the Gibston proportion as a proportion of land area um, planted for Pinot, just that keeps it quite easy. Um, and then I just tweak it back and forth a little bit depending on, on what I do like um, from each site. But uh, 2018 was about 12% came from Gibston, rest being Parkburn. Um, and what was the other question? Whole bunch. Whole bunch. Whole bunch. Um, yeah, being a, being a warm and a ripe year, I like to throw a bit more whole bunch in. So um, average would be about 20% whole bunch um, across most, if not all, of the ferments that, that went into the, the, the rock bird. Okay, and um, a few more technical questions for you. Uh, the whole bunch, um, as much whole bunch from Parkburn as Gibson. And my other question would be uh, the decision to use whole bunch climate or how the bunches look? How, how the bunches look depends on the climate. So let's, <laughs> you know. That know. is true. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's all good. And then, yeah, it's, I tend not to use much whole bunch out of Gibson. There are people who, who do and do really well out of that um, and look mm. great. But from our site, just the nuances of it just mean we, I mean, we get a lot of herbal, herbal notes from Gibson anyway. And it can be too easy to tip that right over the edge into a, into a very leafy cabbage soup situation if you, if you overdo anything like whole bunches. So I just steer clear, well clear of that um, from Gibson and rely on the whole bunch component from, from Parkburn to, to do that business. Okay, excellent. Very, very good. And I think we had a very, very nice comment um, from Jen on, um, I was just trying to get back up to it in my feed there. I've got so many comments, but Jen did say that it was nicely balanced with good tension that suggests it will age very well. What do you think on the aging of this, knowing your wines very well, Mark? <laughs> Thank you, Jen. I really appreciate that. Um... Like I say, it was a warm vintage, and I don't normally regard warm vintages as supremely ageable. Um, and saying that um, things like 2002 out of, out of uh, Central Otago have been drinking really nicely relatively recently. Um, and Rudy made Rockburn back then, and, and I sh shared a, a bottle of 2002 with him oh, 
few years ago now, but it was ridiculously good. So it doesn't pay to write it off. Um, I know that, uh, you know, 10 years is, is pretty easy for, for Rockburn as a rule. Um, I like them at four or five, personally. Um, so, you know, buy enough bottles that you can try it for yourself. <laughs> Very good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Malcolm. And um, I think we're catching up again next week when your barrel release has come out. I'm very excited about this, yes. <laughs> so am I, so am I. Excellent. So what we're going to do now, thank you very much, um, Malcolm. That was fantastic. Um, sorry, I think I've missed a message um, there. Um, the message was that it certainly isn't overripe and that you've done very well, Malcolm. Um, so what we're going to do now, folks, is move on to the next flight of wines. So if you haven't already, and I'll give you just a a few minutes to uh, either find a spittoon or given you're at home, you perhaps don't need to, um, but somehow work out how to pour the next four wines. Um, and if we can do that, then we will in a second move on to Jen. So Jen will be with you in just a minute. We'll just get everyone with the wines um, and we'll just wait for enough uh, sort of indications. We've got all the wines there. And then we will go from there. So have we got people almost with the wines? How's everyone going? I haven't got any thumbs up yet. I've got one. Oh, I've got a couple more too. Okay, excellent. Let me find Jen. And Jen, you've got yourself off mute. Excellent. So now we move to um, Jen Parr. So Jenna's going to talk to us about uh, Wild Earth. So over to you, Jen, when you're ready. Thanks. Um, if you want to mix it up, I'm not insulted at all if you want to taste the wine now, and maybe that can help you think about some questions. So it's not a monologue. I'm happy to bear all, share all. Uh, but first, maybe you were wondering um, about my association with Wild Earth. Um, some of you might know me also as the winemaker for Valley. Um, in 2014, I decided I wanted a bit of a change of direction in my winemaking career. So I sort of um, uh, left my role at Terra Sancta, um, took a little time off to ski, I still managed to do quite a bit, um, and then really wasn't entirely sure what I was gonna do, but Grant Taylor and I had long spoke about um, working together and my friends at Maud also said to me, hey, you know, um, there's a lot of small businesses, family orientated that need, she probably said consultant, but I've since changed the word um, to advocate. Someone who looks out for their in interests, um, help, you know, develop their wines, um, keep them unique, make sure they're having the you know, great quality and consistency, et cetera. And there were a few that um, actually um, were, were there and kind of um, glaring. And the first was, was Wild Earth. Um, I met Quentin when I first moved to um, Quentin Quieter, the proprietor of Wild Earth, was one of the first people I met when I moved to Central Otago in 2007. Uh, we have a similar accent, uh, although he's been here a lot longer than I have. And he was a very open, gregarious, passionate man. He loved um, the winemaking, the wine side of things at the time, but he was incredibly passionate also about food. And when I joined Wild Earth in 2015 as their um, winemaking advocate, uh, I was following in footsteps that would, I, you know, I didn't even dream of filling. Um, starting with Michelle Richardson, some of you will know, who is uh, an inspiration to me, much like Jules Taylor. Uh, and um, even though I never really met Michelle, I thought she, um, she scared the shit out of me, to be honest, but I was really admired um, what she did for Villa Maria and her strength and her winemaking prowess. Uh, then there were people like, funny enough, Grant Taylor, uh, Steve Davies, and Pete Bartle. So for me, it wasn't about following in their footsteps, making the wines they were making. It was about where Wild Earth was in 2015, um, the fruit that I was gonna make wine from and kind of a fresh start in a way. I think a lot of us were, were that was the time when we started to think more about um, vine age and why we were doing what we were doing or weren't doing what we were doing and, and having the confidence 
to really let the vineyard shine through. So that's how I started working with Wild Earth. Um, a couple years into it, uh, Albert, who's hiding in, uh, across the table from me, joined, um, and he's been, um, you know, he's a big part of the the family, and he pretty much runs the the wine part of of Wild Earth, and um, has really enabled me um, to to do you know the work that I've done for them, and kept the brand going, and gave it great new energy. So. Um, when I started, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the story than the wine, because the wine's in the glass and we've heard a lot about winemaking and I'm happy to answer all those questions. But um, uh, for me, um, when I think about this wine or kind of any wine, but particularly wild earth wines, it's kind of a, a, an analogy that um, I read it down so I say it right. But to me, it's, it's musical. So if you think of nature herself, I kind of like to believe she's a she, uh, as the composer. And then the vineyard, the vineyard's the orchestra, you know, and sometimes you have more strings and sometimes you have horns, sometimes you have piano. Um, so that's really the vineyard and the individual parcels that go into the wine. Um, and, and winemaking, I'm kind of the, the conductor, right? And the, vintage, the, 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 the auditorium um, itself, the place that holds this symphony is the vintage. So, you know, if you're at um, some amazing um, hall with people, you know, that come from all over, it's, it's, it's one thing. And, and sometimes you're, you know, virtually um, working alone and it, it's a struggle, but, but, but that to me is, is the vintage. So my job is really about taking everything that's in front of me and trying to make cohesion and, and, and something beautiful that has meaning, but every year it's going to be different. So really to me, winemaking is about seasonality. And this wine comes from um, the block that Quinton planted in at the end of Felton Road, um, quite close to um, where Austin's grapes come from, which will be the final wine that we, we taste. Um, a lot of influence from the river, um, uh, soils that were formed um, you know both by by the by the rivers and also by glacial movements uh, planted some of the plantings go back as far as 1999 um, this vintage that Malcolm talked about uh, I felt you know <laughs> back to the conductor analogy I felt like I was running trains it was crazy I mean it came a month early it was significantly um, bigger than um, the previous year 17 which was tiny we had all our wines to bottle because very few of us have um, bottling lines. So we're beholden to the, the contract bottling facilities and those dates are booked. So we were trying to do everything that we would usually do in three months in the space of four weeks. It was very compressed. Um, the, this vineyard, because I, I had the luxury of working with lots of different parcels across um, quite an interesting um, little valley, we would have picked it over four weeks um, and this year it was probably three weeks, but basically I didn't really feel like I had time to think. Um, I felt like everything came in, it was clean. Um, the winemaking, there, there was just no choice. It, it just was, um, versus the subsequent vintages 19 and 20, which were a little bit smaller. Um, you, you had almost too much time to think, you know, to second guess yourself and think, oh, this, this little choice is going to make such a difference. Whereas in 18, in some ways, I think the beauty and the harmony and the flow of the wines comes from the fact that we just literally didn't have time to second guess ourselves. And, and nature was quite benevolent in, in that she just delivered, you know, with a roar, but she delivered something that was really easy to work with. And um, that to me kind of sums up 2018. So I don't know if any, you know, this wine, um, there's nothing um, particularly interesting about the winemaking. I do approach every wine that I make with the intention to use um, whole clusters if I can, but that is based on season style, the fruit that I'm actually working with, um, and when, it, when they can be included, I like to. Um, and in this wine, there were probably seven or eight ferments that were largely clonal based coming from different parts of the vineyard. So some of them might've had 10% or none. Um, some like clone five, um, I might've used 50% because I quite like a whole bunch with clone five, but the, none, none of that's predetermined. It's all about what I taste and what I see. And for me, it's about bunch size, vine health, and seasonality, and just you know looking at what all the instruments are gonna do together. And if you don't want 
the whole bunch to be like a tuba <laughs> where it blasts out over you know the the oboe or the clarinet you want it to be something that is in the background of the wine adding to the to the texture and to the mouthfeel and maybe to the fragrance of the wine so um yeah i guess that's sort of what i wanted to say but i'd love to answer questions um so we've had one question um well, a couple of questions here but one that's come through asking if you were going to describe the wine, um, Jen. How would you, how would you describe how you're tasting that tonight? I mean, I think it's it's brilliant. It's looking really, really good. Um, but some descriptors for it were what we were asked for. Um, to me, it's it, it's what makes me smile about this wine is like Malcolm was saying, it was a hot vintage, but I don't get heat. I don't get stress. I, I get a real silky sensuality to the wine. Um, there's a real beautiful mouthfeel there. It's not um, super primary. There's, there's lovely lo fruit, but it's not lush for a hot vintage. Uh, it's certainly ripe. To me, uh, I often think of um, the Bannockburn subregion, um, which is the place I've spent the most time in, um, as I always conjure up an image of James Bond, particularly Sean Connery, because it's Everyone's heard of Bannockburn. Bannockburn never lets you down. It always is sensual. It always is safe in that you know when you buy something from Bannockburn, you're gonna get something you're gonna enjoy. Um, and, and that how you define enjoyment is individual, but you're never gonna go, I wish I hadn't bought this or this didn't deliver what I wanted to. It's a really entertaining subregion. I think it's one where um, it just pulls tricks out, out of its hat. But you know, if you're drinking a Bannockburn wine and you're like in the Italian job and the bus is hanging off the edge of the cliff. Sorry, that's my favorite movie. But you know the bus is not going to go off the cliff. You know, James Bond is going to save the day. And to me, that sexy sensuality, this for me is the true essence of what I like about Bannockburn. And we all have people that we learn from and given the proximity to Felton Road, one of the things that I've always loved about their wine and it made me realize that it doesn't have to be just true to them, is that silky, sensual texture. And when I think of Felton Road, the first thing that comes to mind is it's about the texture and it's about that silkiness. And in my journey, um, working with the fruit that I'm working with, which isn't necessarily you know that exact block, I know that it can be done in that subregion. And that's always sort of um, what I'm trying to achieve any, any vintage in and out. Excellent, thank you. And we've had some lovely comments, um, Jen, about your analogies, and we've got some musicians in the room who have absolutely thoroughly enjoyed those. So thank you very much. Um, and the wine's looking excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. And um, we're going to second Central Otago now, and um, we're going to have, we're now moving back in vintage, and we're going to move next um, to Dominique Mondillo. So Dom, I think we'll just unmute you there and I think we've got you ready to go. And this is now your second glass um, in this second flight. So we'll hand over to you, Dom. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Liz. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of it. It's absolutely fantastic. And thank everyone for participating. Um, after listening to Jen's accent and hearing mine, you're going to probably start wondering where you are. Um, but I have been in Central Otago since 1981, and I've been growing grapes since 92. So um, irrespective of how I sound, I have been here for quite some time. So the background, um, a little bit of the background of the Mondillo brand, um, I originally trained as a chef. I had a couple of restaurants here in Central Otago as the chef owner through the 80s and early 90s. And consequently, I make the wines very much in that style to accompany food. You know, for me, it's all about um, that food and wine matching. It's um, sort of growing up in an Italian household. That's exactly the way we sort of treated wine. And um, it was always sort of a, a part of our upbringing. Um, we purchased a piece of land at Bendigo in central Otago in 2000, planted the first Pinot planting was 2001. Um, 
So all we have planted is Pinot and Riesling. So just a couple of varieties and try to stay focused. We have 10 hectares of Pinot planted. Um, and again, sort of that clonal selection is probably not very different than everyone else's. We've got 114, 115, 667, 777, Abel, and Clone 5. So this wine is a combination of all of those clones. Um, the vineyard is, it starts off at 220 meters and goes up to 305. So very variable soils within that sort of profile. Um, it's made up of three terraces. So each terrace actually brings something to the wine and, and certainly adds some variety to to the clones themselves. Um, the 2016 vintage, again, was probably a little bit, 2016, a little bit warmer than 15 and 17 on either side of it. But then again, much cooler than the 2018, the two previous wines that we had tasted. Um, everything is hand harvested, hand plunged, 100% de-stemmed. I've always been a fan of keeping the stems out of the ferment. Um, after you know multiple discussions with other winemakers in Central Otago, but um, for me, I think it, it it makes a wine that I I enjoy. Um, and the thing is that you know adding those stems adds a, a variation to the wine. And and I think for me, it's all about sort of that sense of place and purity of the fruit um, is another reason why I tend not to do that. So this wine has um, twenty five percent new oak. 100% um, French. It's been in the barrel for about 10 and a half months. And, and again, you know, just sort of getting back to that whole sort of premise, I truly believe that um, wine is made in the vineyard. So, you know, we, we attempt to get the grapes as close to perfect as we can outside and then keep our hands off them inside. And hopefully that, that comes through in, in this wine. Um, and again, you know, sort of given that, that soil type that it's in, uh, very high content of stone. And as someone mentioned earlier, you know, I think you actually see that in the wine as well. You know, that minerality flows through in, into the wine. And the other thing about Bendigo, of course, is being that little bit warmer than some of the other subregions in central Otago is that, you know, we're able to get those tannins right. And consequently, I think you get nice texture and nice structure into the wine as well. Um, so, okay. sorry, a couple of comments here, um, Dom. The, the first one is that we've got a New Yorker in the room who loves hearing your accent. It's a breath of fresh air. Um, so uh, John's feeling very much at home, um, but we've got a question on how long would you put this in the cellar for? Um, you know, I think it's, you know, Malcolm made reference to this earlier, and I think it's a very good point. It always pays to buy multiple bottles, taste one, and then you decide how long it should be there. Um, again, this is a 2016, but for me, I think there's still plenty of life in it. You know, it's certainly going to last for certainly another five to seven years um, with ease. We've found more people from New York while you've been talking. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Um, has everyone tasted the wine? It's looking really good tonight. Really, really nice. Thank you. Again, you know, there's that earthiness and also that um, suggestion of spice that I, that I truly believe comes from the vineyard and particularly the 115 clone always seems to add that, that nice dense spice component to the wine that I really enjoy. Mm. We've got a, a very descriptive comment here, which simply says, well. <laughs> oh, good stuff. <laughs> I, I like short comments. <laughs> To the point, we may as well get there. Very good. And how many vintages, so how long has Mondelo been around now? So how many vintages? So the first vintage was 2004. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also make a, um, a reserve called Bella. And in 2016, we didn't make the Bella. So it all went into this wine. So this is 100% of the fruit from the vineyard. Okay, cool. And Bella is a um, barrel selection or a, how do you make the selection normally for that? Um, well, we try to choose different parcels of the vineyard and crop them a little bit lower. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, we kind of put them into a, a few chosen barrels and, um, and then hopefully those barrels are selected. Yeah, cool. Very good. Someone's commented, um, I think, great comment just on how long the finish is, um, which, yeah, it's, it's very, very cool. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Yes. And do we have any more comments um, for Dom before we move on? Everyone's gone silent. What have you done to them? You've made them speechless. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I've hit the mute button. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Well, thank you very much, um, okay. Dom. It's a pleasure. It's, thank you. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you very, very much. And what we're going to do next is we're going to move to um, the third wine in this flight. And we're going to move to Rudy Bauer. And Rudy's from Quartz Reef. Um, Rudy, shall we hand over to you to talk us uh, through your wine? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you, um, Dom and um, Jennifer, Malcolm, Jules and Matt and um, Duncan. Uh, great comments. I don't really know what to say, the truth to be known. Everything has been said. So I, I, I come maybe from a different point. Um, uh, firstly, is that, um, as we know, there are some of the I guess if we look at Central Targopina, one of our footprints or DNA is the ability of producing a pure definition of Pinot as a variety. And also we have this very vibrant acidity. And, and then you got this various separation with various strengths, you know, without any doubts. Uh, you know, I love those sensuality and textual qualities um, you get from, um, uh, from Bannockburn. And I really love this, this fruit and crunchiness of Pisa and a really striking acidity and energetic uh, and, and acidity coming out of Wanaka and this beautiful perfume aromatic aromas, particularly from Alex and not to mention Gibson with this, I love this earthy, really flavors. And I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm born in Salzburg, unfortunately no musical talents like Jennifer. And, and but I do, I do see Gibson is like the, the, the lower keys on the piano simply because they just show a lot of strengths and actually affect quite a lot of depths. Quite, quite, um, quite intriguing and quite stunning. The good news is for Bennigburn is this, because with the Bennigburn um, and, the, and what helps James Bond is in actual fact, um, the, he was trained in Bendigo. And so hence he got the structure and the strengths to make sure that the bus doesn't go over the cliff. But it's very important for you guys to understand, you know, he was actually trained in Bendigo. So just, just that, you know, um, that it's quite important. Another very interesting part is for us, we as winemakers and everybody, please, please come on board. Um, you guys, if you've got any comments to make, it's our extraordinary journey without, with, within our region, but also together within New Zealand, the way we have grown together and find, actually fact, the best definition and best expression of Pina we believe. And that is extraordinary because we do believe we're strongly connected to the land. Ideally, with what we want to do is that you can taste the land in your class. So if it's if it's from Tent Lotago, if it's from Martinborough, or from Nelson, it, or uh, or from Wiper, it doesn't really matter so long if you get the sense the sense of place. And that's getting even more important now. And 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 where I'm leaning now to look after your land in regards that we have a responsibility to make sure that we, we are kind to the land in form of your practices. But also more important is we in many cases are the first generation to looking after young vineyards or establishing young vineyards and of course they age. Um, obviously we are not aging, that's, that's a certainty. Is that okay, Jennifer? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, so that, that also means is the next part is to pass it on in great shape to the next generation. And I guess, Liz, you already will understand, you have seen so many, the growing up of New Zealand Pinot, the enormous evolution we have gone through and finding our own, really finding our own feet as a region and I guess producer and also expression of, of what we believe is Pinot. What I really love on Pinot is, Pinot really wants only one thing to do, is to reflect where it comes from. And then I only got a couple of analogies about Pinot is that I love P 
Pinot is for me a variety which allows you to philosophize because it allows you to think and it allows you to sort out the meaning of life. And the reason is Pinot allows you because it is, is if you have a Pinot, is, as you have a Pinot in your class, it's consistency, consistently it expresses its, its layers of aromatics and palate. If you've got a Cabernet, it's not the case because the Cabernet basically has a, an enormous impact on, on your senses where in actual fact, you, you can be part of it, but you have to be equally strong as, strong as well, but you cannot use emotions where they're deeply, deeply set in with you, where you feel comfortable to talk about um, how we struggle and how we, and how we, um, how we um, brace Pinot. Pinot is actually fact a variety is he, which really wants you to embrace and go forward with it, wants to walk together with you. And that is also very, very beautiful. And this is what we do in Central. We are willing to walk together because Pino allows us to express ourselves because Pino is actually not in competition with any other. And for me, the most beautiful thing about Pino is that the flavor profile or the quality profile of any Pino in the world is extremely wide. I mean, white, you know, you can go from old, from light colored to dark colored from any source of flavors. And it always excites you because it, it wants to be a personality and a character. That, that's why I love, that's why I love Pinot. And I guess uh, from, um, from Quartz Reef, um, uh, Bendigo, um, being lucky enough and have the privilege to be one of the, or be the first one to plant vines there, and basically not knowing if this is the right thing or the wrong thing, I can assure you, and I can assure that goes for, for Dominic and Jennifer, and so it's for everybody else, that if you, if you make a, a statement in form that you put your feet in the ground, you can't go any, you are where you are. And I felt that this particular site is you know, potentially a good site, I know now after many years later, um, planted in 98, that is a very good site, but it's also extremely difficult to understand. And I guess that makes sense. I mean, what we expect after 30 years, you know? And then we always go, obviously we go to Burgundy, we love Burgundy. And at the same time, we know now we are very much in with New Zealand Pinot on the, on the world stage with the same levels of quality, but it's our personality. And I, I, as a personality, I mean the land and the people involved. And I think this is something, yeah, it's something beautiful. Pinot allows you to be reflecting and enjoy what, where you have been and what you do right now. Um, you get those flavors, you know, I don't really want to talk about the wine. What's the point? You know, it's, it's, it, it delivers what it can do. And 17, coming back to seven, 17, I believe it's a vintage, is an extremely nice class. I, I call 17 as classic vintage for Central. It will be a classic vintage when time to come. Because it shows many characters which are part of Central. Again, coming back, beautiful definition of Pinot Noir as a variety and this vibrant acidity. And of course, if you then come to Bendigo, you got the structural qualities coming in. And of course, also Malcolm pointed out, you got the sage and time, time coming in. But, but overall, all you want is that, um, that, you, that you, I guess you want to drink more in order to understand it better. But just one sip by one sip. How about that? Liz, Thanks. all over to you. Fantastic, Rudy. I was just sitting there listening to you thinking, I was down in Central at the beginning of the year and uh, have been thinking recently, when am I going to be back down there? Because one thing that I always come away from Central Otago remembering is how wonderful the people are there. And listening to you tonight reminded me of that. So thank you very much. Thanking you. <laughs> Um, we've got some comment. We've got some comments on your wine. Um, it ticks all the boxes. Which boxes are we talking about? <laughs> um, we'll come back and see if um, we get that elaborated. Um, are the, are the, um, I think it's a wonderful experience. Uh, the style is divine. Uh, and the nose of the wine is absolutely fantastic, which I think, yeah, it's, it's been 
you know, just sitting there listening to you. I've just been sitting there enjoying smelling it. So fantastic expression. Thank you very much. Uh, thanking you. Have, have I got a still? Have I still got a couple of minutes left, or do I? You do. To... You do. You can keep talking, Rudy. I oh, know that's okay. I just want to come back to to to, to Malcolm and, and Jennifer and Dominic and uh, and all the others talked about the various vintages. Yes, it's it's okay that we have this um, look. We are now, and, and thank us for New Zealand, we haven't experienced the same vintage ever. Every year there's a vintage, we're just blown away by it, by it particularly, um, you know, let's say, let's say, um, you know, I guess 2004 and 2005, there were really unusual years of quite cool, um, low yields. And, 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 and then you got 2018, 2001, you know, all those vintages, they reflect something. And then if you want to give the wine a character, I guess ideally it would be great to give it a, um, you know, a symphony, I guess, or an orchestra, whichever we want to talk about it, or, um, or Freddie Mercury, for that matter. It is important that you embrace them as they are. For example, when Malcolm is worried about 18, yes, 18 is unusual. 18 is... Um, a vintage which all it wants to do to cuddle, 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 cuddle all the time because it's that's the wine what the wine wants to do. Where the 19, when the, when the 19 come on board, they're really, um, I think they want to they wanna talk about, there's a sense, there will be a sense of authority coming through, but will they have the, the, the charm and the sensuality of 18 or 16? Well, that's a fair question. And I think that's, we will, obviously we will find out. And also other interesting part of find with Central Targo Pinos, and I go along with Malcolm that the winter between five and eight years is a very beautiful win winter to drink them, simply because you've got still primary fruit that's starting to go in signal fruit, and then you can choose which, whichever way you want to go. Because when it, at the moment, if you've got Pinos, with like, you know, coming back, the 2002 and Central are still very good drinking, but then you're drinking memory. Also remember part of an older vintage you're ringing you're drinking memory and that makes again wine so beautiful because you've got something you can share at the same time where you people have been around in 2002 and say oh wow i remember this one god i didn't expect that this and this is happening and that's important and this is why interesting is that 2020 um will be so important to us because the memories of 20 are just unbelievably unreal so it's almost almost the vintage is what happened to in 2020 is almost more important than the vintage in its own right. It's also the first vintage where we're not talking about the weather, what happened during the vintage during the weather. We're not nobody talks about the weather. It's the first vintage ever. We're not talking about the weather. Anyway, up to you. Um, Rudy, we've just had a question come through. You've got some um, good vine age now. Um, given when you planted your vineyard, are you finding that the wines to you are improving year on year? Is the question? I think it's it's the combination. It's always the combination of of wine age experience, and most important, I think the the the, the impact from an organic and biodynamic point to run your vineyards. Mm. But they're all linking up. It's 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 it's. It's the growing, it's growing up in, in a way to understand all these combinations and at the same time being able to step back. The key is, as Dominic said, it is, it is the vineyard. The, and, and, and how can we make the vineyard most comfortable? Then, then we achieve something in the class, which, which is quite individual. And, and it, it is then able to tell one St. Lotago story. Mm. Wine age is important, but you look, you know, if you're, if you if you, if it doesn't mean if you're 50, you're grown up, does it? <laughs> not at all, Rudy, not, not at, at all. all. Here we go next. <laughs> very good. Hey, we just had a comment through that um, the symphony analogy fits uh, very well here. Whether you're a musician or not, Rudy, all of the instruments are very well balanced. No soloists that stick out. Everything fits beautifully into its place which thank I think you. sums the wine up very, very well. So thank you very much. Always a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we're going to move on um, to our last wine. And um, I, where have we got? We've got Austin up there. So I said before at the beginning, we had two people in the room tonight who used to work at Glengarry. And we finished tonight uh, with Austin, who is based at Terra Sancta. Uh, and Austin used to work at our Dominion Road store. It did. It did. It was very formative. I, uh, when I was studying uh, winemaking in Auckland, I uh, worked at Glengarry's uh, three, four days a week. And it was great. It was a real grinding in what kind of made New Zealand so special to me. Again, you can four winemakers from Otago and none of us speak with a New Zealand accent. Um, um, it was a real grinding for me in kind of what made New Zealand the place that I wanted to be a winemaker in, you know, it was, it was just amazing. Um, so no, it was, it's, it's kind of funny following all of these guys <laughs> that have been talking because they're so well established. They've got such a history in the region of Otago and I'm relatively new to the region. I, I worked previously before at Chard Farm and I've come back now to take over at, at Terra Sancta. And to me, it's kind of building on the shoulders of those giants to me. And Jen obviously was one of the formative winemakers at Terra Sancta and Wilson's before. Uh, so for me, it's trying basically not to stuff anything up, just kind of do as little as I can and, and, and honor the history of the region, to be honest, in the wines that, have, that, that we produce these days. So don't stand around on ceremony, drink the wine, um, throw any questions up there as well. Jackson's block is, um, is, we're very lucky with the Jackson's Pinot and it's uh, a block that was planted in 91, uh, planted to the 777 clone. Um, in terms of clones, I think clones are important to an extent, but if when a vine has been in the ground for 20, 30 years, then clones become kind of secondary and it's more about where it is rather than what you actually planted in the ground. Um, in terms of that uh, the soil, we're lucky at, at Terra Sancta that we've kind of got four distinct soil types. We've got um, a little bit of, um, in this block is kind of defined by kind of classic Bannockburn schist, with a little bit of loam over the top. So it's very, for us, this is our kind of classic Bannockburn wine um, in that uh, our shingle beach is a little more light and lifted and pretty. Um, and the slapjack is very defined by the clay soils. The Jackson's block is defined very much by being kind of classic Bannockburn schist. Um, so it's got those classic flavors of cherries and plums and damsons and, and rosemary and thyme. Um, we like, uh, I think it was Malcolm and Jen both talking about texture. And when we're making the wines, we don't really talk about fruit. We don't talk about much more than picking on acidity and then looking for texture. And that's kind of how we look at the wines. It's very simple winemaking. Um, wild ferment, no finding, no filtering, about 20% new oak. But um, with this wine, 20% new oak is three barrels. So it's, it's, not, it's not a hell of a lot of wine. We, we make kind of, on a good year, kind of 350, 400 cases of this. Um, most years it's kind of 250 cases. We're not, we're not making a lot of, it is a Northern Irish accent. Um, we're not making a lot of, um, um, wine from this block. We, we basically pick it as one ferment and it is what it is. Um, we don't mess with it. So it's, it's a very kind of, open, but most of all of our single block wines are a very kind of honest representation of the piece of dirt that they come from and the year that it represents. Um, so I think with the 16, um, relatively warm year, um, quite cool nights for a lot of the year, a little bit of, of wet weather coming through in February. Uh, and then a kind of settled March. So there's no such thing as a normal year anymore. I suppose 18 was, was crazy, but it's funny, Malcolm was saying that the 18s kind of made him nervous at the time, but uh, looking at them now, they're really starting to show themselves in a fantastic light that yes, we picked them earlier uh, and they maybe show a little more kind of lifted primary kind of fruit right now, but they're really starting to show their, show their structure and and the vineyards are shining the way that they always shine, especially these vines that are a little bit older. Um, but no, it's, and, sorry. Sorry, we've got some questions as to what cats you've got there. Well, oh, shit, oh, sorry. <laughs> the animals have been quiet all night and then the dog started barking and the cat, oh, we've just had to feed her. So yeah, we've got um, 
a little rescue cat called Ray, because she looks like Ray Liotta. And then um, an Australian Kelpie that we rescued in, in when we lived in Australia. So yeah, there's <laughs> lots of animals running around. We've got let, lots of cat lovers by the look of it online. Yeah. Lots of private <laughs> messages. So. Yeah, Ray's a cool. crazy. She's got little bendy legs because she was <laughs> malnutritioned when we rescued her. She was rescued and uh, living in the bins at um, oh that restaurant North Point. What's it called? Can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've also got a great comment here which I think sums it up um, Austin is that you've done really well and you haven't messed with it it's beautiful um, with Pino in general it's uh, uh, as Rudy said it, it kind of reflects sight more than anything else um, so with Pino I think it's I find my favorite Pinos I can't describe I find them hard to pick apart um, I think if wines that I kind of find it easy to write tasting notes or, or describe or wines that I, things are sticking out, but with Pinot, it should be seamless. So you, it, if you can start, if, if you can't pick it apart, to me, that usually means it's a, it's, it's a really good example of, the, of, of Pinot. It's a, Pinot is not a big wine. It should kind of reflect lightness and that kind of ethereal kind of texture acidity all of those perfume all of that kind of stuff but i find good examples of pinot really hard to describe mm. well yeah i think we've seen a lot of really good examples of pinot tonight and that certainly yeah. um is one have, have we got um some more questions for austin there you've also made everyone speechless <laughs> either drunk or ready for bed it's a school night yeah you ha you have got sort of um uh, i don't know whether it's the good end or what it is being the last person to talk tonight but, oh definitely uh, the good end i'm certainly a little bit rosy cheeked so it's definitely <laughs> the good end being last perfect perfect excellent thank you very much austin um Thanks. so um just wanted to finish tonight, guys, with a couple of um, sort of comments and um, uh, some more information for you. The first thing is just to thank very much the winemakers that we've had online tonight. You know, when we came up with this idea that it'd be quite fun to have uh, eight winemakers join us online and then put the call out. Um, we, we had a sort of wish list on who we wanted here tonight and you all said yes. So thank you, um, absolutely perfect. Um, and what a, what a great collection of people together. And I think it's, it's allowed us to show everyone tasting um, tonight, just the diversity of New Zealand Pinot Noir. And, you know, we've seen some older expressions. We've also seen different parts of New Zealand and um, to actually be able to hear from um, the winemakers themselves has been quite a unique experience. Um, so also just wanted to share that um, we do have a Pinot Noir sale on at the moment, which is why we'd, you know, timed a lovely walk around tasting this Saturday at Vic Park, but wasn't to be. So um, there is a sale on at the moment. Um, and there's a number of really good deals in that. Just a heads up, Jules spoke at the beginning and just wanted to say she's actually got one where there's six bottles and a magnum. I think I looked this afternoon, there's about nine magnums left. So just if you were inclined to the first wine, that would be one to jump on very quickly. Um, as I said at the beginning, we'll send out an email tomorrow morning, which will give you a video of the tasting tonight um, and also um, some more offers in that. So you'll get that tomorrow morning. Um, also did just want to share that the little bottles that you've got, we do recycle them. Um, so um, the environment, as Rudy talked a lot about tonight, um, is very important to us as well. And um, in putting these together, we were keen to work out how we could um, recycle the glass and not have the waste at the end of it. Um, so you can drop them back into any Glengarry store. You will um, have to wait until level two, I'm afraid. 
um, please don't drop them back at level three. The team will not appreciate it. Um, but once we get back into level two, um, then you can ideally down to our Victoria Park store, but any of the stores um, will take the bottles back. Um, so yeah, a very big thank you also to everyone who's joined us online um, tonight. It's been an awesome tasting and great to have all of the support. Um, and I did just want a special shout out. I know he won't appreciate it, but we do have my father online um, tonight as well. <laughs> so it's been great to have you there, Dad, and great that you could join us. And I know he will have really enjoyed um, all the stories and the wines. Um, so thank you all very much um, and hope you've enjoyed the tasting. Uh, and um, if you'd like to do more of these online, um, not that we're wanting to be in level three lockdown much longer, but we do quite like this format. Uh, so if you just Google um, or just look on our website, virtual tastings, um, then um, you'll get all of the details of the ones that are coming up. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> thank you. Lots of clients. Go. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Rudy. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Many thanks, Liz. Greatly appreciated. Cool. Okay. Take care. Very good. Thanks, good night. Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. Cool. <laughs> thanks, Ted. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the comments. Hey, Liz. Yeah. Online, when I look on the website for Glengarry's, the wine price is different to what's written in this. Yeah, for one of the wines, isn't it? Yeah. How do we get the, the price that's on here? <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a mistake on the order form. We will honour it. Okay. Um, and the best thing to do, actually, if you just, the okay. easiest way is just to email me, so liz at glengarry.co.nz, and I'll make it happen for you. So, okay. thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See ya. Thanks, guys. Thank See you. Ya. Bye. Liz at glengarry.co.nz.